Donald Trump was at the center of this conspiracy. And ultimately, Donald Trump, the President of the United States, spurred a mob of domestic enemies of the Constitution to march down the Capitol and subvert American democracy. President Trump summoned the mob, assembled the mob, and lit the flame of this attack. First primetime January 6th hearing laying the foundation for a specific case against Trump. Now, foundation is something you build on. The committee's trying to do that Monday with the second hearing, bearing down on how exactly Trump knew that he actually lost. Then there'll be evidence going inside the DOJ about what would have been the mother of all Saturday Night Massacres as Trump tried to oust the acting AG for resisting efforts to have the DOJ help with the coup. Three former officials will testify. On Thursday, the committee will focus on Trump's efforts to pressure Pence. We all remember that. And later hearings will feature evidence on Trump's efforts to overturn the whole election through state-level means. Representative Kinzinger, the other Republican member besides Cheney, says the evidence together at these hearings will change history. The Watergate hearings were famously about what Nixon knew and when he knew it. These hearings are going from what Trump knew to what he tried to get government officials to do, from the DOJ to Congress to state election officials and state legislators, a kind of dizzying spread of targets for what was an increasingly desperate effort to stay in office. Now, most of those officials balked or outright resisted because coups are, among other things, a team sport. Donald Trump, never very good at teamwork. And that may be why, as mentioned, the committee has so many witnesses, including Trump aides and plenty of Republicans, who are out here testifying in detail under oath to his illicit goals and demands. Joining us now is Professor Melissa Murray from New York Law School, co-host of the Strict Scrutiny podcast. And as an educator, we believe somewhat more skilled at teamwork. Um, thanks for joining us on a Friday night. Thanks for having me, Ari. Um, we just laid out where the committee is headed, uh, including some of the theory of the case. So walk us through your thoughts on that. So I think the big thing here is they are very much trying to show that not only was Donald Trump at the center of all of these machinations, this wasn't inadvertent or coincidental. This was something that he wanted to be at the center at. Indeed, it was something that he was orchestrating or directing others to orchestrate on his behalf. So this really goes to the question of mental state. And that's critical if there's going to be criminal liability going forward. And of course, the committee can't determine whether or not there's a prosecution against Donald Trump. That's only for the Department of Justice to determine. But if the Department of Justice is going to go forward, it has to be secure in the knowledge that there is evidence to support the idea that not only did Donald Trump do certain things or fail to do certain things that he was supposed to do, but that he had the mental state to orchestrate this kind of coup against a lawful government. And so this is all incredibly critical. And even if there is no criminal prosecution, all of this evidence regarding his mental state and what he knew and at what time could be critically important if there's going to be civil lawsuits against Trump and anyone in that inner circle, the kinds of civil lawsuits that we saw successfully prosecuted in Charlottesville, Virginia, for example, against the organizers of Unite the Right. I'm also curious what you thought of the way they presented this last night, which appears to be a template. Um, Rachel and I discussed this a little bit last night. Because everyone is accustomed to the traditional hearings. First of all, when they're not select committees, you have the partisan back and forth. Uh, second of all, everyone gets their time. And this format is really putting one to two members of the committee in the lead, a limited number of witnesses live, and then really drawing on the evidentiary cream, if you will, if you want to be a huge nerd with me, the cream of hundreds of depositions and not making the public sit through that, which again is different from traditional hearings. So I'm curious as someone who, who really is versed in the presentation of the law, what you thought about that last night because it's so different than most hearings. Well, Ari, I'm wearing a dress that's literally covered with books. So obviously I'm happy to nerd out with you. On and you this, have a lot of books behind you. I like big books, and I cannot lie. Um, this is obviously incredibly, 
<laughs> Good shout out. This was obviously highly choreographed and by design. And you know, this was very similar to what they did for the second impeachment, where there were a lot of multimedia presentations designed to sort of link all of this together. Here, though, they're actually, I think it, it's necessary to have this kind of highly choreographed presentation rather than the back and forth that we're used to, because they need to tell a story that brings together some really disparate pieces of this puzzle and shows how they're all inextricably intertwined and linked together. And so, you know. So again, this the usual sort of partisan back and forth. Um, it's not really the case here because there are only two Republicans on this committee, so there isn't the necessary back and forth. But it goes with a kind of interrupted flow. Here, they have an uninterrupted moment to present their case, to present it the way that they want to present it without any rebuttal in between. And they can actually lay the case out for the American people, show how all of these different disparate pieces of evidence link together, and do so in a way that's compelling for a generation that, frankly, is not the kind of generation that we saw in Watergate that's sort of used to sitting in front of the TV for hours watching these sorts of things. This is a social media audience that wants to see fast paced Based, clickbaity, like interesting and very dynamic clips all put together, and they're doing that. So they've gotten a lot of blowback for having it be produced, but I don't really know that they had any other option. Yeah, and I would say that that blowback is only on the internal sort of Eastern Seaboard uh, obsessive discussion range. I don't think most of the 19 million Americans watching it live were like, oh, when I read in Axios who the committee hired, I think they're going to really just say, was this a clear story or not? And as, if we, as we've emphasized, um, if it's done right, that's so people can have the facts. What they decide about that should be up to them in a democracy. So um, I've got Beschloss on standby, so I'm going to let you go into your weekend. Professor Murray, good to see you as always. Thank you.